Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I had the pleasure of coming to the previous conference in 1999 as a Tamil activist, at the time as editor of Tamil Guardian also. Um, so in many ways, as I come back to a um, slightly different looking university now and see a whole uh, layer of young Tamil activists, we know the, the Tamil struggle is in good hands. What I wanted to talk about today is um, a kind of a set of thoughts that have emerged in, the, in different sort of articles that I've written, but also in, in interactions with um, people on the Tamil diaspora, people, policymakers, academics, and so on, who engage with the Tamil diaspora. Now, the Tamil diaspora is a phenomenon. It's evolved into a major aspect of Sri Lanka's politics over the last few years, and is also the subject of extensive study now. It's kind of a cottage industry on studying specifically the Tamil diaspora. And this has had, over time, a set of implications for the object being studied. So the Tamil diaspora, the way it's been represented in academia and therefore in policy spaces, has shaped what the diaspora itself is. I want to say a little bit about that. <coughs> um, so my argument is that, the core of my argument is that the study of the Tamil diaspora, diasporas, conflict diasporas in general, but spe specifically the Tamil diaspora, the way it's been represented in academic publications and therefore the policies that have been formulated in response to the actions of the Tamil diaspora have been an integral part of the broader repression of the Tamil people. That's quite a strong claim, and I'm going to try and illustrate that today. But then before I get into the diaspora, I want to say something about categories. Early on today, in the opening um, moments of the conference, um, there was a reference, a categorical reference to the Tamils as a minority. Now, I want to say a little bit about this because this is quite a profound claim when you refer to a community as a minority, you have already placed them in a hierarchy within a collective. Um, to illustrate this, now in India, 1.2 billion people, there are 70 million Tamils, or 80 million Tamils. Clearly, numerically, they are a minority. But no one in India would refer to them in that way. No one would refer to the Tamils of India as a minority. They are referred to as a people. Uh, by contrast, there are 100 million Muslims in India who are referred to as a minority. The point I'm trying to make is that your numerical relationship with the larger collective is not the same as your political standing. To give another example, in the other national community to which I belong, the British, um, in, in the UK, there is a minority. They comprise about 7% of the population. Uh, they have slightly different customs, different food, some would say even a different language to the rest of the population. They live mostly in the north. They occasionally make political claims. Sometimes they try to secede. They're called the Scots. Less than 7% of the population. No one will refer to the Scottish people as a minority. They are a nation, right? It's a political claim. So when you find yourself either referring to the Tamils in Sri Lanka as a minority, you've just made a profound political statement, right? You have defined what the limits of their ambitions should be, right? So categories have enormous effect. That's just um, something I wanted to mention because I heard it this morning and it kind of woke me up. Okay, so the Tamil diaspora. The Tamil diaspora is part of the Tamil nation. It's an unremarkable fact, right? If there is such a thing called the Tamil nation, the Tamil diaspora is part of it. Well, if that's true, we wouldn't see a number of claims made about the diaspora. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a belief that the outcome of political movements or political debate or contestation in the island of Sri Lanka should be decided by the people there, not the diaspora. The diaspora can hold their courts, 
but it's their responsibility, it's their struggle, right? We have a secondary role as diaspora. Well, if you're part of the nation, how can that be true? If you're part of the nation, we all have responsibility collectively in shaping the future of the nation, right? So the reason I'm saying this is it becomes something of a common sense to build a hierarchy between tunnels in one geographical space and tunnels in another geographical space, to allocate rights to some and take those rights away from the others, right? To build a hierarchy amongst tunnels. Now, if you do that, there's no nation. It can't plausibly be a nation. <clears throat> and that's very common. People take it for granted that that's how we should engage in understanding the relations between the tunnel diaspora on the one hand and the tunnels in Sri Lanka on the other. And that comes out of a certain conceptual split that's in the social sciences and that has worked through um, the politics and the policies of, the of how the diaspora is engaged with. So what I mean by that is when you question the right of the diaspora to do this or that, you're making a claim about authenticity. Who is a real Tamil and who is not? You're making a claim about legitimacy. Who is uh, allowed to speak for Tamils and not? And you're speaking about a hierarchy. So in other words, who has the right to decide? It's often you hear the claim that because, say, a certain political party has won elections on the ground, on the ground, because we live in the air, it means that we cannot challenge that, for example. Uh, in the comments I'm making today, I'm not attacking any one or other diaspora organization. I'm not speaking for one or other diaspora organization. I'm speaking collectively as a community. How can we accept those kinds of claims while claiming that we are a nation? <clears throat> okay. So what I'm going to do next is just work through how diaspora is typically conceived of in the scholarly literature particularly when it comes to diasporas like the Tamils, who are understood as a conflict-generated diaspora. And I'm going to say something about the implications of that for our political possibilities, the scholarly representation. Then I'm going to say something about how um, this has worked through in policies during the Cold War, the post-Cold War, during the war on terror, and in the post um, post-war era of Sri Lanka. Okay, what is a diaspora? Well, there's a huge definitional debate, um, and there are more or less sophisticated answers to that. But overall, it starts with a geographical split. If you're in a country and you're outside, the relations between your home state and your host state define how we should understand diasporas. And um, there are more sophisticated and critical accounts of this, but in essence, that's what it is. Homeland, host state, and the relations between those communities. Now, that assumes there's a difference between Tamils there and Tamils here. There are, of course, differences. We dress slightly differently. Uh, we have slightly different customs, and that's because all of these things, culture, tradition, uh, language, evolves, right? In that sense, we are all hybrid. But what aspects of that difference are politically important is the debate, right? In other words, which aspects of that difference allow a claim of political separation? The Tamils are different to Tamil diaspora, or Tamil diaspora is different to Tamils there. So how is this separation typically conceived of in the literature? Usually it starts with cases like the Tamils with the conflict. It doesn't start with the Tamils, it starts with the conflict. There's a conflict in country X. People leave, go to other countries. From those countries, they may remain politically exchanged. So there are two things. First, you have to understand how the conflict is designed, defined, and then you have to look at how the relations between people outside and that conflict is designed, defined. So, and as a result of this, you have appropriate and inappropriate forms of political activity. Let's start with Sri Lanka. What's the problem in Sri Lanka? Is it state repression? Is it genocide? Or is it conflict? Civil war? 
Because if it's civil war, the answer is conflict resolution, peace building. If it's genocide, it's national liberation. Okay? So starting with how you understand Sri Lanka already positions the diaspora in certain ways. For a long time, and to this day, people describe Sri Lanka as a civil war. Right? A civil war is not the same as state-led genocide. If you accept it's civil war and the solution is conflict resolution, the diaspora has one of two roles. They contribute to conflict resolution or they undermine conflict resolution. Warmongers or peace builders, those are the two roles. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, you define it as genocide, the Tamil diaspora becomes resistance, survivors, the ability to continue to exist despite genocide, beyond the range of genocide. So you see there's a big difference. It's how you, the country's conflict is defined that explains how the diaspora is understood. Either way, there's something unique about the diaspora. They're not really from connected to people over there, right? Because they are the authentic people. These are people outside. But on this side, they're not really Canadian or British. They haven't quite arrived. Because they keep these connections. So somewhere in between these two national communities, there is this existence. And how they behave is defined by this framework. <clears throat> so, putting this together, the dominant understanding of conflict defines the appropriate and inappropriate behavior of people from that country abroad. And it is in this way that the diaspora became a policy problem on the international stage. The diaspora appeared on the international stage as a policy problem. Right? Because they were supporting conflict in their homeland. They were not survivors of genocide. So suspended between belonging there and belonging here, it allows a whole range of policy interventions to happen. First of all, to deny arguments they make, claims they make. Uh, someone earlier said, if you say it, no one believes it. You need to get someone, you need to get a white man to say it. And then it becomes real and fact, not claim, exaggeration, etc. On the other hand, whilst you're here, because you're not quite arrived yet, you're then subjected to a certain kind of exclusion from your community. That's why the war on terror, surveillance, raids, arrests, racial profiling, all of these happen on the basis you're a Tamil. Right? Not all Tamils are terrorists, but all terrorists are Tamils. Right? So what Fatima was saying earlier about profiling and um, how the war on terror works through assumed racial categories is just as true of us. Um, some of the younger people may not remember this, but some of the older ones certainly will. What happens when the LTT was prescribed? Okay. I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment. So the diaspora is separated from hostland and homeland. That's where it becomes a position where things can be done to it. It allows the suspension of rights under anti-terror law, anti, anti laws, and it enables the institutionalized racism in host countries. So, I lost track of time, but since I'm chair, I'll just keep going. So the global context. From the very start, the diaspora has been an international phenomenon. This is before the start of the armed conflict. Surveillance of the diaspora, and certainly in the UK, and I suspect in other countries, by the intelligence services, the police forces, was underway long before the start of the conflict. And if you look at how the diaspora has evolved, the kinds of institutions it built, the kinds of practices it, um, that are emblematic of it, they are deeply shaped by the global context of the time. Um, for a start, the diaspora, never, at the outset, never saw itself as outsiders. It just saw itself as part of the Tamil struggle. The Tamils in London or Sweden or Canada saw themselves as part of the struggle. And that's because in the 70s, national liberation struggles always included diasporas. Whether you're talking about the ANC or you're talking about Palestinians or you're talking about any movement, the, the, the fact that your community is global means your struggle is global. 
It's only in the 90s that this idea of territorial separation became important. So during the Cold War, um, the idea of self-determination emerged as a national liberation decolonization concept. And Tamil, Tamil diaspora was part of that. In most struggles, you will find people who grew up outside their homeland were involved in the struggle. It's nothing different about the Tamils. But of course, the reason that the Tamils were being watched by the British intelligence services was during the Cold War, Sri Lanka was seen as part of the free world. In the war on communism, J.R. Jawana's government was an ally against the Soviets. Therefore, people who opposed that government were a problem. <coughs> With the end of the Cold War, and the era of what we would call global liberal peace as a project, the diaspora became a problem because they were interfering, disrupting conflict resolution. Right? So having separated the Tamils from there to Tamils from here, we could make all kinds of claims. They're over here, they're very rich, you know, they're meddling in other people's affairs. If they're British, why don't they just, you know, eat fish and chips and get on with it? Why do they keep insisting on trying to shape matters over there? And so on. So in other words, the claim was made, if you are truly to be part of our country, you would not be involved in conflict over there. Later on, of course, the proscriptions and the war on terror enabled like, powerful interventions on this claim. But essentially, that was the point. You're not allowed to be part of two nations. You can only be part of one. Right? If you're part of the British nation or the Canadian nation, you shouldn't be interfering as in the affairs of the Sri Lankan nation. And the war on terror and the prescription of the LTT allowed a whole array of policing of diaspora activity. Um, in other words, how do you support the support of the Tamil Tigers? They don't carry ID cards. What they tend to do is say things like genocide or self-determination. Right? So during the era of the war, the kind of people, certainly everyone who came to the first conference here, were seen as supporters of the Tamil Tigers, as I'm sure are we. So in that context, what I'm trying to get you to think about is how it's possible to say and do things to Tamils only because you have set them in relation, in hierarchical relation with Tamils over there. If you accept the Tamil nation as it exists, you cannot make those claims. We are simply Tamils in exile. Okay. So, but what is the actual reality of the Tamil diaspora? Always they have been separated, right? But always they have been united. Families in the West have supported families throughout the war. Right? There's a huge amount of money sent home to keep people alive, to keep kids educated, and so on. As a community, the diaspora has supported the life, the, I literally mean the life, of the people at home. And so social, familial, economic, and political relations stretched across geographic spaces and were never contested. It's like having a family. Right? Just because you leave one country and go and live somewhere, it doesn't make you any more or less of the family. Right? It just means you're geographically separated. So the political claims based on diasporic separation kind of deny that. Now, if you take this idea of a nation facing genocide for granted, if you believe that's what's going on, then it's a space of resistance. The diaspora is a space of resistance because it has escaped genocide. It cannot, it's beyond the range of artillery and abductions and disappearances, mostly. Right? It's the place from which the possibility of struggle can continue. A guru made this point about, um, um, Dr. Kumar Wadi made this point about parallel institutions of state. He was explicitly talking about the Tamil nation building its own institutions. And in that framing, he understood the diaspora and the homeland Tamils is just one. We have to build our own. The we is collective. Now, this, the Sri Lankan state has always understood the diaspora as a site of resistance. It has always understood that. So, we all know about 1983's Black July pogrom, right? And the standard story in much academic literature is that the Tamil Tigers attacked the Sri Lankan army, they killed 13 soldiers, there was a reaction, there were 3,000 people killed in the next few days. We know this. 
What was the Sri Lankan state's reaction? Given the LTT had just killed in a shock attack, what was the Sri Lankan state's reaction? It didn't ban the LTT. Instead, it passed the Sixth Amendment. Right? The Sixth Amendment, if you read it, has an interesting clause. It forbids discussion of secession, either inside or outside Sri Lanka. Right? So the reaction to the shock was to see the diaspora as the rear base of struggle forever and a day. Right? So right from the start, they could have banned the LTT, which is a typical reaction in counterterrorism today. No, they banned the idea of Tamililam being articulated even abroad. And that, I think, is significant. Because to this day, the diaspora has been viewed as a place from which the challenge to singular Buddhist hegemony, which Dave and others spoke about and Peter Chok talked about today, it's, it's from here that we articulate this. You can't hold this conference in Jaffna. So what does this mean for the Tamil diaspora? First of all, it to be self-reflective. We have to understand that we are not in between two spaces. We are across two spaces. We are both Tamil and British, both Tamil and Canadian. Right? It's quite an important switch. It's supposed to neither fully Tamil or neither fully Canadian. That means when people say that you cannot speak for them, other Tamils, or other Tamils cannot speak for you, you have to ask yourself, why not? As a member of the nation, I have the right to say what I want about the nation. We may disagree as members of the nation, but I have a right to speak for the nation. Second, because we live in two nations, we belong to two social formations, there are rights and responsibilities that come with being British or Canadian. Uh, many speakers have made this point about the great powers. Right? Mistake. France, Britain, and the United States, three permanent members of the Security Council. Everyone has a powerful diaspora. Right? Look at it from Colombo. Hundreds of thousands of tunnels in these countries. Citizens with the right to call their governments to account. We cannot speak about these countries as if they live in some other world. They are your countries. They are our countries. So we should make demands on our political representatives as British or Canadian or American, or French, or what have you. This is the real power of the diaspora. That's why the Sixth Amendment made it clear, trying to, in some way to reach into another jurisdiction and outlaw political action. So challenge denials of being part of the Tamil nation and denials of being part of the host nation. To pull back, in conclusion, I want to make some general comments. <coughs> The Tamil diaspora is here to stay. It's a permanent part of Sri Lanka's politics. No matter what people write, what people say, no matter what laws are passed, in the next 10 years, 20 years, there will be no political activity in Sri Lanka that the diaspora will not have a view on and will be able to influence. Unless, of course, they manage to murder everyone abroad. Right? As a geopolitical force, the diaspora is emerging. They, that was very clear to the Sri Lankan state even 30, 40 years ago. But I think this is often denied by accepting this position of we're not there and we're not here, but giving up the rights of being citizens in Western host states and giving up the rights as being Tamils, part of the Tamil nation. And given that the struggle to survive genocide, the struggle for self-determination will go on and on and on to go until, I guess, there are no Tamils left in Sri Lanka, and even then it'll go on, or um, the diaspora is able to achieve change. It's protracted struggle. The state, the Sri Lankan state recognizes this, then settle down for it. So, in summary, the diaspora is established as a geopolitical phenomenon in 20th, 21st century politics. It straddles two national social formations, at least two. It is embedded in a space that is beyond Sri Lankan state violence. Ergo, it is an embedded space of resistance to genocide. It makes possible actions like institution building, 
political advocacy, and so on, that cannot be easily destroyed by Sri Lankan state violence, not unless it is able to harness the power of other states, for example, like during the war on terror. And so from this position, it is repeatedly, every day, challenging state sovereignty. The, the question about the UN process, whether it will work or not, is one thing. But the fact that when the Sri Lankan ambassador goes to the UN, he finds the tunnels there in the space of states, so making the accusation, you are a genocidal state, in the sovereign spaces that states expect to walk about in. That's a very powerful act, if you think about it. That the state is said to be indebted. The reason it's indebted, as the Sri Lankan um, government itself said, the diaspora is waging an economic war on us, right? Lobbying to lose trade benefits, lobbying to take away special privileges. And so you have to think of it from the other's perspective. If you sit in Colombo and you look at the world, is it a secure future you look at when you look at a million tunnels who are saying we are going to resist genocide? I'll leave it there. Um, I believe Kamala's